Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to those of you here today, as well as those worshiping with us online. Stop in Solanke Commons after worship if um, you want to sign up to be on a coffee fellowship team. If you have any questions, feel free to chat with Marianna and she'll tell you all about it and help you out. We'd like to thank our guest organist, Becky Burkert, for sharing in our worship leads the last eight weeks. Thank you so very much, Becky. At this time, I invite Bob Weller, Chair of the Elders, to come and share some details about communion. Good morning. Well, if we haven't learned anything in the last 18 months of this COVID journey we all seem to be on, is there's, there's no weekly. <laughs> Each week, there's something new. Uh, about a month ago, the elders decided to move communion or make communion available at the table again, just as we had always done. At that time, Delaware County was experiencing fewer than five new cases a week, and it, uh, national numbers were all down. It seemed like a good idea a month ago. Now, it doesn't seem like such a good idea. Um, this Wednesday at the elders meeting, we talked for some time about whether to continue that process and, and have communion here at the table where I'm sure all of us really want um, to have communion. But we felt at this time with the Delta variant and the changes in um, numbers that it would just be safer to go back to the two-in-one packets. So those are available now out there on the table. If you did not pick one up, there will be a deacon around at communion time. Um, just raise your hand, and you can get a two-in-one. But we're not going to be at the table for a while. We will. The elders will continue to look at that, and at some point it will be safe to come back to the table. But it's just not the right thing to do now for all of you and the people at the table. So, unfortunately, we're back to these little packets. And if you have any trouble getting the lid off like Sue does,
Just raise your hand. I'll come over and open it for you. Thanks. We've all certainly learned to be flexible. Um, if we haven't learned it yet, you know, we, we might as well, because that's the way life is right now. Thank you, Bob. At this time, we have a responsive call to worship. Children of God, welcome. Whether online or in person in the sanctuary, welcome. Welcome to this place of love and grace. Welcome to this place of hope and perseverance. God invites all of us to be a part of the beloved community. God invites all of us to share in the good news. We are welcome just as we are. We are loved just as we are. In gratitude for all of this and more, let us worship God. If you would like to stand as so moved and join us in our opening hymns of praise, we will be singing, We Call Ourselves Disciples and Sister, Let Me Be Your Servant. Please stand if you would like. <laughs> Serve Christ. 
Join me in prayer. We have come to worship you, O holy God, who is giving and gracious and who loves beyond measure. We have come today in affirmation of our desire to be followers in the way of Jesus. We come with gratitude for all the many things for which we have to be thankful. We are grateful for the simple pleasures of life and the kindnesses we receive along the way. We are grateful for the many bodies and hands that work hard at physically demanding jobs to grow, harvest, transport, and stock our food for us. Help us to look for other positives every day for which we may also give thanks. We lift up many concerns to you this morning as well. You know our hearts. You know our fears and our anxieties, our worries and our angst. You know those who are grieving and in need of your comfort. You know those who are ill or struggling in need of your healing touch. You know those who have hardened their heart to you and are in need of a compassionate rewaking. Help us to be attuned to ways in which we may help in these and other situations. For those working so hard to keep us safe, especially the medical personnel who has worked so hard and at great personal risk to care for those affected by COVID, we pray for relief. They are so tired. You know the strain they have been under for almost 17 months and how they have been pushed physically, mentally, and emotionally by the enormity of this pandemic. Help each person do their part to relieve the burden on the medical community. We pray too for open hearts, minds, and hands that we may truly desire to be a part of your movement for wholeness in whatever way we are able, even when it is uncomfortable. Whether here in person or participating in worship online, help each of us to listen for the Spirit speaking this day, guiding and inspiring us to do your will as your co-laborers here on earth. It is in the precious name of our brother and Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Welcome to our children at home. If you'd like to come a little closer for our little children's lesson here. Good morning to all of you. I want to know, have you ever seen one of these? What is that? That's a welcome mat. Where have you seen something like this before? Usually we see a mat like this outside the door to our home, wouldn't we? Welcome. What does the word welcome mean? It means to receive someone in a warm and friendly way. As Christians, we don't just welcome people at our church doors. We also welcome them to come to the communion table each Sunday. One of our scriptures today, Hebrews 13, chapter 2, says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Wow. By welcoming others to take communion with us, we may be welcoming an angel. Jesus said, He who receives you receives me. Now, if we turn that around, we will understand that if we do not welcome others into our homes and into our churches, it is the same as if we are refusing to welcome Jesus. We wouldn't do that, would we? Well, let's put the welcome mat out, and let's be sure that we mean it. Holy God, Help us to remember that when we refuse to welcome others to our homes and to our church, it is the same as refusing to welcome you. Father, give us the grace and strength to welcome all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, children.
As sinners who have been redeemed, we are all welcome to take our place beside the Savior. And we're all invited to sit down and be set free. start on the outside the outside looking in this is where grace begins we were hungry we were thirsty with nothing left to give oh the shape that we were in just when all hope seemed lost ladies for that beautiful song. Our scripture today comes from Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. 
The next scripture is Hebrews 13, 1 through 3, and 5 and 9. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison, as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured, as though you yourselves were being tortured. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings, for it is well for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by regulations. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow, that song was so beautiful, I'm not even sure that I really need to preach, but I've got it written, so here goes. Over the years, I have explored a number of church websites, and pretty much every single one will state what a friendly church they are and that they welcome the reader to come and visit in person. Not one of them says, excuse me, We don't really want new people. Not one says, we are a closed off church and set in our ways. And I believe that these churches believe that they are welcoming. And to some people, they are. But sometimes in person, there's a silent unless following the statement of welcome. Unless you are this or unless you are that, then what? you're not really welcome, unless you change who you are or what you think. Here's the thing. Everything we do as a congregation speaks louder than the words of welcome we say. And unfortunately, I have listened to far too many heartbreaking stories of how people have experienced not being welcomed by a church's actions. A frequent commonality in the stories I hear is this. The person telling the story was different than the majority of the church members in some way. Maybe the person questioned some of the teachings of the church, and for that, they were just shut out instantly. Maybe they disagreed with the pastor's theological teaching, and the pastor responded out of a need for control rather than a respect for differences. Maybe they were parents of small children who had difficulty sitting still and received many glares instead of smiles of understanding. Maybe they were single when everyone else their age was married, and so they were never included in social events. Maybe they were gay. Maybe they were autistic and had trouble controlling their curiosity and emotions. Maybe they were from another country or another race. Maybe they had a child whose gender identity didn't match the one the child had been assigned at birth. Maybe they were teenagers dressed in a way in which church members disapproved. Maybe the person was homeless. Maybe struggling with addiction or mental illness. Maybe a Democrat or a Republican or had tattoos or a nose ring. The possibilities go on and on because there's just so many ways to be different than the majority in any given setting. And congregations are, compu- com- excuse me, are composed of human beings who are very good at being judgmental towards those who are different than ourselves. It's part of our human nature. The Torah is the first five books of what we call the Old Testament or First Testament, and some call the Hebrew Bible. Rabbi Ari Hart wrote that there are 613 laws in the Torah. He says that some of the laws only appear once, and a few appear multiple times. But one stands out above the rest because it is repeated 36 times. It borders on divine obsession 
the rabbi says. And what is it? Simply love the stranger. Another way of saying this is care about and welcome the one who is not like you. The one who is different and therefore easy to judge and to just write off as other. Rabbi Hart says perhaps the command to love the stranger needs to be repeated more than any other command because loving the stranger can be incredibly hard. It's just so easy to not love the stranger when we have our own needs and concerns to worry about. And it's much easier to love and therefore to welcome those who look more like us, raise their children like us, pray like us. In fact, he says, far too often we are actually made fearful of a stranger by our faith communities instead of being encouraged to love one, encouraged by those who profit by fear. Just as the Torah makes this need to love and welcome the stranger an imperative, the teachings of Jesus and the Second Testament also point to this. Today's passage from Hebrews gives us some specific examples of how to do that. Show hospitality. Help to provide a bed or shelter and a meal. Care about those in prison as if you too were one of them. Care about victims of abuse as if you, or I would add, someone close to you were one of those abused. And this is followed by the directive, don't be obsessed about getting more money for ourselves. I find that an interesting placement for that statement. It's very telling that so many centuries ago, people struggled with the same temptation that plagues many of us today. Too often, our obsession with stuff and getting ahead gets in the way of tending to relationships with those to whom we're already connected, let alone our being able to care for and welcome those we don't know and who are different than ourselves. The author of Hebrews is telling the audience then and telling us now, don't put financial gain above people. People are more important than accumulating money. Our disciples' identity statement says, we are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world, which we explored last week. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, as part of the one body of Christ, we welcome all to the Lord's table as God has welcomed us. In the welcome video that you will find in your newsletter on Wednesday, you will hear a number of disciples express what welcome means to them. They say things like being included, being able to be yourself, being accepted without having to change, a feeling of belonging without a bunch of conditions, feeling at ease and, and feeling understood, unconditional, being able to bring one's own gifts and talents to share, Love without judgment, feeling joy at being together, experiencing fun, sharing laughter and tears. And friends, the really beautiful thing is this. In being welcomed and in being welcoming to others, we are transformed. Think for a moment about a time you felt truly welcome here at church or somewhere else. I'll bet that people were glad to see you. They were glad that you were part of the group. And you could tell that they were really glad through the tone of their voice, their facial expressions, and their body language, as well as their words. They were at ease with you, and you were comfortable with them. This is what we want others to feel when they visit any of our disciples' congregations. Disciples want others to feel the unconditional love and welcome of God through us 
no matter how different someone is from us. And to make sure we are being welcoming, disciples also periodically look at our practices, our customs, and our ways of being and doing church. It's hard to be an outsider, to come into a group where you don't know what to expect and what is going on. So we stop sometimes and ask ourselves, what can we do to make this a more welcoming place? So that we might proclaim boldly to all, you are valued for who you are, and we want you to feel included and able to share your gifts and talents with us. We want you to feel included and to have a sense of belonging here. And one of the ways we disciples do that is to extend our welcome to the table. As disciples of Christ, the table is central to who we are. We believe this practice of communion was instituted by Jesus, and therefore it is Christ's invitation, and it is Christ's table to which all are invited to partake each week. After Christ returned to heaven, his followers met together in homes on the first day of the week because it was the day of the Lord's resurrection. A primary purpose of the Sunday gatherings was to remember the resurrection. And these were joyful gatherings in which followers of the way of Jesus of all social levels joined together to share a common meal followed by communion. Historian Justo Gonzalez says that from these early days, the Christian church has seen in communion its normal and highest act of worship. By the year 100, the weekly common meal had been abandoned while the Lord's Supper was retained. And the joyful nature also remained as Christians continued to celebrate and participate in the new reality which had dawned on that first Easter morning. The symbol of our denomination is a chalice a stemmed communion goblet, and for good reason. Our founders believe that the Lord's Supper should be the center of the church's life and that we experience through the observance how Jesus creates one body out of many. In the practice of participating in communion together on such a regular basis, we internalize in our bodies that we are one in Christ, and we acknowledge that God has placed us in each other's care. The Campbells and Barton Stone also believed that the use of one loaf and cup best represents this oneness. Today, it is common to have pieces already cut up to aid in dispersing of the elements to the congregation. And now, individual elements are essential for safety reasons during the pandemic. But even so, the oneness is still represented by the one presiding over communion, breaking the bread as part of the words of institution. Another thing that is different from those earliest congregations is the use of grape juice rather than wine. This began in all Christian churches during prohibition And disciples continued this practice even when prohibition ended. It is much more welcoming to not serve an alcoholic beverage. For disciples of Christ today, it is not so much in how we do it, but that we do it. That each week we take time to come face to face with Jesus at the table. And he welcomes us every single time. Despite the fact that we may have betrayed him in our actions or denied him with our attitudes and unkind words, it is not because of what we have said or done, but in spite of our human nature and any hard-heartedness which we have exhibited, that Christ invites us to be nourished at this meal. 
And by partaking, we are reminded of the great lengths to which he went to make God's love known for all. Like the first century congregations, communion for us is a memorial act, a time of remembrance, celebration, and gratitude for the gift of Jesus and the new life to which he calls us. From the early days of the Stone Campbell movement, the unity of Christians has been a significant focus and one which we still see in our denomination today. Traditionally, this has meant that one does not have to be a member of the congregation to partake of the bread and cup during communion. Anyone who considers themselves a follower of Christ is welcome. For the First Testament congregations, communion was only shared by those who had already been baptized. And that is still true in many congregations today. However, There are a lot of us disciple congregations who have expanded our understanding, and thus no one is excluded from partaking of the communion elements. The table is central to who we are because it is symbolic of the love of Christ. Just as God accepted us, we accept anyone who joins us in worship to also join us in partaking of the bread and juice if they feel so led. Who are we to say no when the Holy Spirit may be working in a person's life in a way we do not understand? Disciples are people of the table, and this extends to our children as well. We affirm that parents are our children's primary faith educators. And disciples recognize that our congregations are comprised of many people who grew up in a variety of faith traditions and have a variety of beliefs. We disciples are careful not to place barriers to the Lord's table that Jesus did not put there. He once rebuked his disciples who tried to turn children away, saying, let the children come to me. Therefore, we trust parents to guide their children in regards to the partaking of communion. Communion is at the center of our identity. It is the pinnacle of our worship. As part of the one body of Christ, we welcome all to the Lord's table as God has welcomed us. Amen. We celebrate that one body and one bread as we stand as you're able and feel so moved and join our voices together. One bread. One bread, one body, one Lord of all. 
I remind you that if you didn't get um, communion on the way in, just raise your hand. We have somebody waiting to bring it right to you. But if you would, wait and open the packets when we get to that part of the service. Friends, it's not easy to love the stranger, to care about those who are so different from ourselves, to stand up for the good of others and not just ourselves, and to truly welcome them. But Jesus showed us the way as he modeled inclusion of those usually left behind by those who held the power and the religious authority of his day. The table reminds us that we all are loved and welcomed. And I believe it helps to empower us to offer that same love and welcome to others. For it was on that night when Jesus was about to be betrayed and he knew what lay ahead. And yet he left us with this sacred ritual. As he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. When you eat of it, remember me. And in like manner, after the meal, he took the common cup. And he said, this is a symbol of the new covenant, my blood shed for you. When you drink of it, remember me. And so it is when we eat of this bread or drink of this cup and all of the elements that we use to represent it, we remember the Lord's birth, teachings, life, death, and most of all, we celebrate the resurrection. Let us pray. God of love, your word states that as often as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim your death. Thank you for this communion, which is a symbol of the relationship between you and us. Let us pray the Lord's prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
When we take the time each week to come together, whether in person or via Zoom, we are sharing in the presence of God in a special way. We know that we are part of something bigger than ourselves, and we are reminded that God's arms are always open wide, and we are always welcome. We also have the opportunity each week to give back, out of a heart of gratitude, a portion of that which God has already given us. And through these gifts which we freely choose to give, God's gift of welcome continues to be shared with others. Give with joyful gratitude, whether in person or digitally via Givelify or through the mail. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, you are faithful and just, and we can always trust in you. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have provided us with so much. We freely give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give back what is yours. O oh Lord, use these gifts to advance your kingdom. We pray these gifts will reach, bless, and influence many. In Jesus' name, amen. As we leave from this place, we leave with one spirit of love. Please stand as you feel so moved and join us in this modern hymn. great note to end on to remember that we have one spirit of love 
And a bonus for those of you who don't know, that was written by Andrew Moran, who is a disciples minister and musician specifically for disciples uh, congregations, although, you know, it is available for others to purchase as well. But um, she's quite popular in disciple circles, and uh, I think that we'll be seeing that song come up uh, in the rotation to remind us of that spirit of love that we lead this place with. And as you go, know that you go with the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit to carry you through. Amen. Thank you.